Shalom and blessings to you. I'm Reverend Clifton McDowell Sr. I'm the pastor of the Church of God of East New York, located in the heart of Brooklyn, the East New York section of Brooklyn. We're so glad that you chose to tune in to our channel for this message. We believe that God has a word for you. We hope that you will subscribe to our channel and like us. Now let's go in and hear a great message. Today, we, as we go into this, as we are in this Advent season, we want to start a series called God's Gifts for the Season. God's Gifts for the Season. As we go into the Christmas time and as we go into the New Year time, I believe that God has some gifts that he wants to give us, gifts that are very necessary. Many of you will remember um, the movie The Wizard of Oz. The Scarecrow wanted what? He wanted brains. Amen. The tin man wanted what? He wanted a heart. And the lion, the king of the beast, he wanted what? He wanted courage. When you think about, when you think about the rescuers in 9-11, when you think about those, those men and those women who ran into buildings that were on fire, there was something about their training, something about their heart, something about um, their emotions, something about what they felt. It was called courage. They displayed courage even at the risk of their life, physical courage. And I'm told there are different kinds of courage. There's physical courage. There's social courage. There's emotional courage and moral courage and even spiritual courage. Do I need to change? Amen. It took courage for them to run into those buildings. It took courage for them to rescue those who, amen, were in peril. It took so much courage on their behalf. And when you think about our ancestors, it took courage for them to, amen, to survive the things that they survived. slavery that they went through. It took courage for them to survive the Jim Crow that they had to experience. It took courage for them to survive, amen, the anti-black laws that were put in place in order to keep black folks back. It took courage for them to survive and persevere through segregation and an injustice system. It took courage for them to survive systematic racism that was put in place legally, amen, by our government in all kinds of situations. It took courage before leading Israel into the promised land called Canaan. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, the Lord let Joshua know he would need courage. And he told him, he says, have not I commanded you? And he looks at Joshua, speaks to Joshua, and tells him, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. If ever we needed courage, we need courage now. We need God, and God wants to give you, give me the gift of courage for the season. We are, in, we are God's people, and as the church, we need to take courage for this season in our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. There's an example of courage that took place at that first Christmas we often miss it because the focus is usually not on him. The focus is usually on a young mother and the birth of a baby. But the character that today I want us to focus on, amen, this morning was in the story too. Amen. He, he heard firsthand that his bride was pregnant and it was not his child. He experienced a, a personal, direct message from God because of this extraordinary event. This brother stood by the manger. 
where the baby was laid. This brother provided protection and provision for the mother and child during the early years of the child's life. The man's name, of course, is Joseph. And he was an example of courage. In the book of Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, I want us to read the account, amen, and there are three things I'm going to leave with you that speak to the courage of this man, that speaks to us this gift of courage that God wants to give you, God wants to give you, and God wants to give me in this season of our lives. Let's stand as I read Matthew chapter 1, verse, starting at verse 18. And it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Mm -hmm. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. She's going to conceive, but you're going to name him. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, here it is again, and he gave him the name Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. You may take your seat. The first thing I, I want us to see from the life of Joseph is that God gives courage to ordinary people. In the midst of this story, the miraculous birth of Jesus, and it was miraculous, it was supernatural, but we find just an ordinary man by the name of Joseph. There were many folks named Joseph in his day. He was just an ordinary man. Many of us, when we read Scripture and we look at the characters of Scripture, we tend not to think or view them as ordinary. Many times we attribute to them almost... Um, Superhuman qualities. They're, they're, they're like superheroes with extraordinary abilities. But the reality is that he was just an ordinary man, just like most of the characters, if not all of the characters in Scripture. They're people just like you and me. They had problems. Anybody have problems in their life? Fears. They had doubts. Amen. They got hungry. They got thirsty. They got laid off from jobs. They had worries. They had failures and weaknesses. Just like you. And just like me. Yet God was able to use them. Oh, glory. God was able to use them anyway. In fact, one of the major themes of the Bible is that God can use ordinary people. One of my favorite singers, many of you may not even remember her, but some of you that are in my season know. Amen. Danny Bell Hall. Remember her? Amen. She sung the song, Just Ordinary People. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and just like you who are willing to do as he commands. God uses people that will give him all, no matter how small your all may seem to you, because little 
becomes much when you place it in the master's hand. God uses ordinary people. He gives courage to ordinary people. Paul states it like this, this same truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, when he says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God choose, chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame, amen, the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Amen. God chose foolish things. Amen. Look at your neighbor and just ask him, which one were you? Amen. Foolish things. He chose, amen, things that were weak, and he chose the lowly, and he chose that which was despised, those that were not. Amen. It was so that nobody can stand before God and boast. We can't stick out our chest and say, we, God, needed me. I, I, I was so good at what I did, God chose me. That's why, no, no, no. God chose you for the opposite. God chose you because he could make you what he wanted you to be. There might have been, you might have had a skill, but there was too much of you in the skill. And God said, I can get you out of the skill and use you beyond you, beyond you anything you can think of. Amen. Why? Because God uses ordinary people. Amen. And Joseph was an ordinary man. Amen. He was an ordinary Jewish man. I'm so glad God doesn't, doesn't forget who you are. Because even in the, uh, at the end, the Bible said there would be represented of every nation, every tribe, every kindred. In other words, you're going to still be black in heaven. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. He was an ordinary Jewish man. But he was a man God could trust. Amen. To be strong in the midst of a crisis. He was strong. He was resilient enough to protect his family. Matthew says it this way. He was a just man. In other words, he was a man of honor. He, did he have concerns? Yes. But he was a man. As the scripture tells us, he was just. This is how the birth of Jesus, Messiah, came about. It says his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be, with preg found to be pregnant. Lord, have mercy. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the Lord. It concerned him. He was a man of the Torah. He was faithful to the Lord. He did not want to expose a man, his betrothed to public disgrace. And so he was going to divorce her. He wanted to put her away, men not, not make a public example of her. But he was an ordinary man, but he was a just man. What that means is that then Joseph demonstrated moral courage. You, you see moral courage. You see, you see physical, spiritual courage, and you see social courage being demonstrated through his life. That was the very character of God that was on display through the life of Joseph. That's tough. Your wife, your, 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 your betrothed is pregnant. That's tough. I want to submit to you that in this season, we need courage. We need moral courage. We need social courage. We need emotional courage. We, we, we need physical courage. We need spiritual courage. We need courage. We need God to give us the courage we need in this season. We need courage to do the right thing just because it's the right thing. To do the right thing every time just because it's the right thing to do. We need courage just because it honors the Lord. 
and we'll do it. And we need courage to do that. Courage to be honorable and decent and honest and united and holy and considerate and just in a season of compromise in a season of unholiness, in a season where there's so much division and injustice and complicity and dishonesty and inconsideration and indifference, we need courage. I'm so glad that God gives courage to ordinary men and ordinary women and ordinary young men and young women and boys and girls. God still gives courage to ordinary people. Second thing, we need to look at Joseph's life. Not only does God give courage to ordinary people, God gives us the gift of courage to overcome our doubts and fears. How many of you will be honest and say that you've had doubts and fears in your life? Amen. Since you, since you have be, gotten older, you know, children have doubts and fears. Young people have doubts and fears. Young adults have doubts and fears. And no matter what season you're in, you will find your face with some doubts and some fears. But I can only imagine, I can only imagine, amen, what Joseph, Joseph must have felt when he found out, when he was told, Mary's pregnant. Remember I said he was an ordinary man, so I can only imagine his natural response. Amen. You don't know what you do. Y'all not going to talk back. His response when he finds out that his, his betrothed, the one that he is going to have children with, the one that he's going to have a nice Jewish wedding, his mama has planned it, the village is prepared for it, and she's pregnant. What would your response have been to find out Mary's been unfaithful? Because that's the only thing that you can think. She's been unfaithful. He knew the child was not his. He knew he kept his robe down. He, he knew he had not been intimate with her. And if she's pregnant, it ain't me. Must be her. What emotions do you think he would have had? Shock? Disappointment? Frustration? Embarrassment? Anger? or a concoction, a mixture of all of the above. And yet Joseph's character, his integrity, even before God explains what's going on, he makes up in his mind he doesn't want to put her to a public display of shame. And so he makes up in his mind he's going, he's going to just put her away, divorce her privately, secretly. He will not bring her before the judges. He will not embarrass her. And so he makes up in his mind that that's what he's going to do. He's able somehow to keep a rein on his emotion. His love for God and, and his love for Mary compelled him to look for a way to protect her. Scripture tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind so that you may pray. And he says, above all, love each other deeply. Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins or a multitude of faults. And then offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Love deeply. Joseph loved Mary deeply. He loved God. He, he loved God's word. And so he looked for a way that he would not have to embarrass her or put her up to public shame. Then you read in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Oh, Joseph was a man of courage. Look at the restraint. Look at the self-control. Look, look at the resilience. Look at him, and you can see courage in his life. With courage, he faced down his own emotions. It was courage that he courageously chose to protect Mary. Can you imagine the rumors? Can you imagine the fear of rumors, the, the doubts of, of what's going on, amen, that, that must have um, began to spread through the community? She can't be showing that quick. Something happened before they got married. You know, sometime, well, hey, listen, I, I'll say it like this. Say, listen, there are some birth dates that come in our families before the wedding date. And your, our kids get old enough to find out, um, you know, what, what, what happened. <laughs> Jesus' birthday, amen, came before Amen. It wasn't nine months. That was the quickest birth. <laughs> if they were to compare his birth date to the wedding date. There would have been rumors. You know how folk talk. The neighbors would have thought that they'd broken the law. They had been intimate. Obviously, the neighbors thought that they must have been having a sexual relationship prior to marriage. But the reality is, they did not consummate their marriage until after the baby was born. And consummate, consummation of the marriage was part of the wedding. So if you really look at it, Jesus was born out of wedlock. I'm just saying. Your Savior, your Redeemer, was conceived out of wedlock and born out of wedlock. And so if you're going to look down on folk that have been born out of wedlock, you're going to have to look down on the Savior. Who's a man of low degree, acquainted with grief. Everybody can identify with Jesus. He's got, he's got some Hagers in his line. He's got some Tamars in his line. He's got some Ruth Moabite Ruth in his line. So everybody can identify with Jesus. And so it took courage for Joseph to embrace this woman and embrace this child to believe God. There may have been, there, there would be consequences. It's, but it's always the right time to do the right thing. I want to get that across. Young men, young women, it is always the right time to do the right thing. There may be consequences at doing the right thing. There may get pushback, but God gives the gift of courage to face even our doubts and our fears. Face the rumors and the pushback of others. You can face it. Because God gives courage in the face of fears and doubts. The third thing I see is that God gives courage to face the future. How do you face the future when your first child is not your child? When your first child is surrounded by rumors and all kinds of whispering. God gives you courage to face the future. One songwriter 
tried to capture it like this. He says, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry on the future, for I know what Jesus said. Today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what's ahead. I don't know about tomorrow. It may bring me poverty. But the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that be my portion may be through the flame of flood, but his presence. Oh, doesn't that make a difference? But his presence goes before me, and I'm covered with his blood. Many things about tomorrow. I don't, I don't seem to understand. Watch out for those folk that seem to understand everything. That they've got it all figured out. They know everything about everything. There are no doubts and no fears. I don't know about everything. I don't even understand, but I know who holds tomorrow. And the one who holds tomorrow is the one who holds my hand. Now that gives you courage. Wouldn't that give you courage? He, the one writer says, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. He gives us courage to face the future. Another songwriter says it like this. He says, the future lies unseen ahead. It holds I know not what, but still I know I need not dread why, for Jesus fails not. Does he not know what I shall meet upon life's rugged way? Will he not guide my halting feet lest from the path I stray? No matter what, how things look to me. Nor if they threaten sore, I know my way prepared shall be. Why? For Christ leads on before. So he, 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 he sums this uncertain future, unknowing future, by saying, I'll follow him with rejoicing. I know he safely will lead me to my eternal home. God gives us courage to face the future. You don't, folks are going to horoscope readers. Reading, going to seances, going to spiritual witch doctors, trying to find out what my future holds. Why would you go to a hell-bound person to try to ask them what your future holds? When you have God's word, when you have the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit abiding within you. And even if you don't know what the next week holds, you know who has it in his hand. You know that he promises that he'll be with you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. What? Submit to him or acknowledge him. And what will he do? He'll make your path straight. He'll direct you. You need direction. Go to Jesus. You need guidance, you go to the Lord. You need wisdom, you go to him. You wait on the Lord and be of good courage. In the case of Joseph, he was given a vision, a dream to help reinforce his faith. He knew the neighbor's opinion of him would change. We thought he was such a good Jewish boy. He was raised so proper. Their opinion of him was going to change. Anybody walk, anybody had some opinions of you change on false information? He, he knew there would be rumors flying around the community, around the temple. 
But he also knew that God had spoken to him. God told him in a dream. Joseph called him by name. Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, is of the Holy Ghost. Now Joseph has to either believe it or think he ate some bad chicken. But when he wakes up from the dream, the Bible says he believes it. Why? Because he takes Mary home as his wife. And, he, and he's, she is like a peach out of reach to him. I ain't touching you. No, there ain't going to be no heavy petting here. We're not going to get the motor running. They did not consummate their marriage. There would be no doubt in either of their minds this child was born of the Holy Spirit. Does God, does God always give us supernatural vision? A dream? No. But sometimes he does. Sometimes God will give you, God will give you a vision or, or speak to you in a dream, but just know the vision or dream will not contradict what God has already said in Scripture. The Spirit of God and the Word of God are always in agreement. Sometimes he will lead you to a verse in the Bible and show you how that verse applies to your situation. Amen? He does not do that every time, but sometimes he does. That's if you're spending time in the Word. I'm not talking about you folks that never read your Word. But when you get in trouble, you flip it. And you hope it speaks to your situation. Nah, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you are walking with the Lord and you're in the word of God, amen, and he can lead you to a verse of scripture that speaks directly to your situation. Sometimes he'll speak to you through a message. Preacher don't know nothing about what you're going through. But that Sunday, the message speaks directly to your situation and circumstance. It might be through a song that the worship team presents. Through a person that the Lord sends your way. You just happen to sit in the right row, in the right section. And the Lord had someone minister a word of encouragement, a word of wisdom, a word of understanding just at the time that you needed it. Sometimes God will work that way to strengthen your faith and your obedience and loyalty to him. But you know what God will always do? Can I tell you what God will always do if you are a Christian? If you are a faithful disciple who's following the Lord, know what God will always do for the one who has received Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen. The one who the Holy Spirit is abiding in their life. Know what God, the Lord, will always do. He will never leave. He will never forsake you. Scripture says in Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You can always count that God will be with you, he'll walk with you, he'll guide you, and he will direct you. If you will submit to him, if you will acknowledge him, he says, I'll never forsake you. This fact, this reality should give us courage to face the unknown future, to, let, let, to, 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 to rather than trying to um, fix things on your own or to, or to manipulate things, why not trust God? 
Why not trust the one who can see your life from beginning to end, who sees where you're coming from, who sees where you are, and sees where you're going. And not only does he see where you're going, he sees what you're going to meet when you get there. I take it a little bit further. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, red, yellow, black, and white, all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns no one? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Aren't you glad the Lord is praying for you right now? Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Remember what I said. There's one thing you can count on God always doing. He may not always work through dreams and visions. He may not always point you to a specific scripture or give you a song. He may not always send a specific person. But God says, listen, I'll never leave you. And he says, what shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter, to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, no matter the things that you can name in your life, no matter the things that have happened, the things that are going on, the things that will happen. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He gives us courage to face the future. So when we face doubts, when we face fears, when we face an uncertain future, and when we're tempted to run in another direction, you ever been tempted to run? <laughs> Ask Jonah. When you're tempted to run in another direction just to avoid what looks to be difficult, what looks to be painful, what looks to be a wilderness experience. I want to tell you, here in the West, especially in North America, we like our comfort zones. That person sitting around you, behind you, or at home with you, they love to be comfortable. And if we are approaching an area of the unknown or discomfort, we try to find another way. We look for detours when we're driving. That's understandable. But we look for detours in life. When we come against a difficult situation, we try to find a way around it. To make a U-turn, try to avoid it. We are afraid of the wilderness. There might be giants there. There might be bullies there. There might be rumors and teasing there. There might be hardships and struggles. There might be racism and injustice that must be faced and dealt with. But Joshua knew that the only way to the promised land was through the wilderness. The very thing that we tried to avoid in life will detour us from what God wants to give us. There's something that God wants to do in us and through us on the journey. And what we have to take hold of is that where he leads us, he goes with us. Because God gives courage to face the future. 
God gives courage to face our doubts and fears. And God gives courage to ordinary people. And the world may look down upon you from being ordinary, thinking that they are extraordinary, but the devil is a liar. The Bible says, do not despise small things. Be careful how you look on people and say, well, you feel like you're extraordinary, but they're just ordinary. Because whoever you are today, that's not who you were yesterday. Remember the past. Remember the, the path that you have come to get to where you are today. God has done something in you extraordinary, but he took you as an ordinary person. My challenge to you today, those of you that are listening, receive God's gift of courage. You need courage in this season. You look on the news, you need courage. As you look at families and you look at marriages, you need courage. We can stick our head in the sand and say, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, handle nothing. You can't stick your head in the sand and be a Christian. You have need of courage because God has placed us here for this time and this day. Somebody said it's the worst of times, but it's the best of times too. God has called us to be salt. God has called us to be light in this day. And he has given us, he will give you what you need, the courage you need to face the future. My pastor, Reverend Lorena Arch, was known for singing. And she would sing a song every now and then. God leads us their children along. Song says in shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet. God leads us their children along. Where the water's cool flow, bathe the weary one's feet. God leads us their children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives the song in the night season and all the day long. Through sor those sorrows befall us and Satan opposed, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives the song in the night season and all the day long. You and I don't get to choose what we're going to have to face. We don't get to pick and choose what the challenges of our lives will be. But God will not put more on you than you can bear. And God will not send, allow you to go in through anything alone. But God says, I'll be with you. And God can give you the courage to face whatever the future holds so that you can follow him with rejoicing. And so I challenge you, those that are here in the room, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, those that are listening at home, why not place your trust in this God? Trust them with the details of your life. With your past, with your present and your future. But some of you say, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. Thank God for the message but I'm dealing with some church hurt. Someone hurt me in a church. Maybe it was this church, some church, and you vowed, I'll never return. I don't want that Jesus. But think about it. You are rejecting the God who created you. And you're calling it church hurt.
You ever lost your luggage on a plane? You ever had a flight canceled? That's airline hurt. You ever lose your mail or a package that was to come to you? Or I Listen, I had a package coming to me. It was some nice shirts. Shirts you I have never seen anywhere. And they were taking forever to come. And I'm tracking it. And, and then eventually it says it was delivered. And it's not at my house. I had ordered them off of, off of um, Amazon, but it came from China. And uh, UPS say they delivered it. They didn't have no picture. And I went through all this and paid good money. And it says it was delivered, and, and the re what happened was they delivered it to the wrong house. And when they went to the house, they couldn't, they wouldn't tell me where they delivered it. They went to the house to try to recover the package. The person said, no, we ain't got it. They got it. I've got Amazon hurt. I got UPS hurt. I do. We were planning to go to St. Croix as a family. I wanted to take all of our kids. We were at the airport and one flight after another, we couldn't get on. I got jet blue hurt. But guess what? I still fly. I still use Amazon. I still use UPS. And so do you. But some of you have been tricked by an unseen enemy who wants to keep you from the people of God, who wants to keep you from the... the, the um, the surroundings that will help you to grow in faith. So you stay away because you got church hurt. And now you've gone the other way. You've just turned your life over and said you're going to do your thing. And now you get, you got, you'll go to a club and you'll get hurt at the club. You got club hurt. You still go. It's a trick of the enemy to allow past trauma, past hurts to prevent you from being a committed member of the community of faith. But I want to submit to you that no matter what you're going through or been through, that the Lord is here for you. Amen. And he will be with you to strengthen and guide you into your purpose and destiny for which you were born. So can I encourage you to give God your hurt. Find your healing. Receive God's gift of courage to trust again. Courage like Joseph. Courage is given for ordinary people like you and me. Courage to face our doubts and fears and courage to face the future. I'm going to ask those of you here if you'll just stand to your feet. You got church hurt? God can heal it. And he'll give you the courage to face it. You could sign up for a small group right here in this congregation that will help you to grow strong in the family of God, to deepen your roots in the family of God, 
amen, to bear fruit in the family of God, to learn how to walk alongside somebody to help them to grow in their faith. Because God gives the gift of courage for this season of your life. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Christ we come. We, we honor you that you still use ordinary people. We thank you, God, that you still give courage to face our doubts and our fears. We thank you, God, that you still give courage to face the future. Physical courage, moral courage, social courage, emotional courage, spiritual courage. You give us courage for the season of life that we find ourselves in. Father, I pray for that person who is listening, who is looking, their God, who has been hurt in some kind of way, and they have allowed themselves, their God, to be tricked. To stay away from the very thing that could help them. I pray for them. I pray for their recovery. I pray for their courage. I pray for the people of God. Their God, those who name the name of Christ, that we would have courage in this day to do the right thing because it's the right thing and because it honors the Lord. That we would be people of integrity, people, dear God, of consideration, a just people, a holy people, a righteous nation. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your direction. Have your way in us and through us, we pray. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Joseph. Thank you for him saying yes to your will and yes to your way. Thank you for Joseph and for the courage that he displayed. May we too demonstrate that kind of courage in this season of our lives, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I hope you enjoyed that message, and I hope that you will like and subscribe to this channel. If you want to experience a live service, be with us at this same channel next week on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Until next time, God bless you.